body. Um, and he can currently be seen on the big screen in The Holdovers, which reunites him with his sideways director, Alexander Payne. Please welcome Paul Giamatti. Right on. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I feel you. like that probably happens everywhere you go. Like oh, you go constantly. Like Starbucks. Everywhere. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> I was no, just I an In and Out burger earlier, and that happened in there. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. A, a standing ovation in the drive-through? Uh, no, I went in. Actually, oh, I went in. Don't yeah. don't do that. Why You're not? You're not supposed to ever go in. No, nobody recognized me. It was fine. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I buy that. I don't. I actually didn't tell you this, but a few weeks ago, I was. Uh, you saw me in an Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't gonna out it's you. Not but. rare. Yeah. Um, no, I had a Barton Academy sweatshirt on, oh. and I was eating at Ely, uh -huh. and uh, uh, people kept coming up to me and asking, like, "What is that? Is it a real?" <laughs> So many questions about a sweatshirt. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, it's this new movie. It's The Holdovers. And they kind of looked at me blankly. And I was like, it's a new film from Alexander Payne. And then I was like, stars Paul Giamatti. And literally everyone went, ah, Paul Giamatti. Oh, all right. There you <laughs> the go. Italians love you. Love me. Love <laughs> me. Absolutely. My yeah. people. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a very convincing t shirt, actually. I mean, it looks no, it like is. a real like school t shirt. Yeah. It was so or weird. Sweatshirt. Yeah. Amazing. Because people kept asking, like, what, what it was. I've it never looks had very so many. Convincing. Yeah. 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 I thought about wearing it, but I didn't want to brag too much. Um, so this is an audience of your fellow SAG after That's actors. Awesome. Yeah. All right, right on. So I always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Holy cow. I think it was um, this movie I did um, called, I think it's called Past Midnight or something like that. Round midnight, near midnight, after midnight. <laughs> it's, it's midnight something. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it was a kind of, I mean, I don't know, was it a sketchy movie? I think it, I've never seen it. Oh, come and so, on. It's yeah. a horror film, right? Is it a horror film? It's a, it's, it's a kind of slasher thing. It's a trivia thing because it's yeah. the first produced script written by Quentin Tarantino. Get out. Yeah. And I remember when I got the script, I was like, that's got to be a fake name. <laughs> I was like, the hell kind of name is that? And I, I, I think it was probably meant to be a bit of a kind of parody of a slasher movie, but mm. I don't think anybody realized that when they made right. the movie. So I don't know. I, I never saw it. I don't really know what ever happened to it. But I think I got my sad card then. I had one scene in the movie, and I think that's when I, must be when I got it. It's so lost in the mists of time, all that stuff back there. I'm so, so intrigued I think, now. I want yeah. to see this. By this movie? Yes. Okay. You tell me how it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Quentin Tarantino and your first film? Come on. Quentin Tarantino, yeah. Yeah, it's wild, isn't it? It was wow. a first produced script, yeah. Did he leave his name on it? Because I never. His name was on it. I'm oh, telling wow. you. I did the script, and I was like, that's a crazy name. <laughs> <laughs> the hell is that well, name? Well, you're not wrong. Yeah. Um, well, all the way from there to The Holdovers now, which you are earning rave reviews for, uh, playing a boarding school teacher in the 70s. Uh, this marks your first collaboration with Alexander Payne in almost 20 years. Had you been waiting almost for this exactly. call? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, it's not for lack of trying, because we definitely wanted to do other stuff. While we were doing Sideways, he told me about the movie Downsizing. He told me the plot of Downsizing. And I was like, that sounds so great. And he wanted me to do that. And then it became financially irresponsible to cast me in that movie because <laughs> uh, it got more and more expensive. So, you know, they went with Matt Damon because oh. if you can't get me, you go with Matt Damon. <laughs> he is the poor man's He's Paul Giamatti. He's the poor man's Paul Giamatti. He's the poor man's Paul Giamatti. <laughs> very, very poor man's Paul Giamatti. Um, so that didn't work out, but we talked about things. I keep, I wanna, I keep wanting to manifest this. We talked about doing a private eye, but <gasps> private detective movie. Because Alexander says he wants, me, wants to see me get shot at and beat up a lot, <laughs> which sounds great. Yeah, he's got some issues. <laughs> he's got some issues. So we tried things, and then we tried to make this for a while mm -hmm. and just never could. The oh, schedule really? Worked, yeah. Oh, I was. And so what finally opened up the scheduling? Did you finish Billions? Or? No, it just, it just worked out. We wow. just finished at the right time, and it was all ready, and I could go. And he really wanted it to be in winter because mm -hmm. he really wanted snow. 
and we got real snow, which is amazing. I mean, it's, it's, every time it's snowing in this movie, if anybody's seen it, it's really snowing, and that's rare, and it, you can feel it. Yeah. You can tell it's really snowing. It's really cool. Uh, he has said that he the role was written for you. It's The character is named Paul, and um, that has to be really flattering, except for the part where he describes him as odiferous, wall-eyed misanthrope. Um, so how, how do you feel no, when he... sent he, it to me, yeah. 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 <laughs> he was like, I wrote this for you. I'm like, that's interesting. That's very curious. Is this how you see me? <laughs> what is odiferous? Yeah, smells like fish. The thing, the smelling like fish thing... The smelling like fish. I'm giving away the smelling like fish thing to people who haven't I seen it. I think everyone has seen the movie. Is people seen it? Oh, okay, yeah. cool. All right. Come on. That was actually from, the whole movie was inspired by an old French movie. Yes. Yeah, from the 30s or something, which I gather in France is a big, you know, kind of holiday thing. And uh, the movie is called, in French, the word means like codfish, because I think the guy smells like fish in that movie, too. Really? Yeah. So... Yeah, you know, the script comes to me, wall-eyed and smelling like fish and sweaty palms and all that stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, this looks, this sounds great, yeah. you know? I'm like, that sounds right up my alley, actually, a lot of that. And, but you know, then all that stuff was really, the character was amazing. Everything about him just kept putting him further and further outside kind of any zone of acceptance, yeah. kind of. It just was like, oh, God, he's such, he's so on the margins of everything. This guy. So I thought it was a wonderful character. I have to be honest, when, when the movie starts and he's calling these children this, these horrible names, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come back from this. Uh -huh. but <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Oh, really? But he's not a bad guy, you know? No, he's not, ultimately. No, no. But Alexander makes a really great distinction between nice and kind. Mm -hmm. And he's always saying, this guy's not nice, but he is kind. That is a huge, huge thing with me, and I would much prefer kind. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, you've said also that you really knew this world of uh, prep schools. Um, how, so in addition to that, how did you sort of go about preparing to play Paul? To play Paul. Paul. Paul, Paul, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that's also really kind of what he meant when he said, I wrote this with you in mind. Um, I know that he got the writer, David Hemmingson, he was interested in him because David had gone to one of these places and I went to one of these places and I grew up around a lot of academics and stuff like that. So I think, you know, he's always, it's funny because he could have, I'm sure he could have written something like this, but he goes, but I don't have the depth of knowledge, mm -hmm. so I shouldn't do it, which is amazing, you know, that he's, he, he's, He's, he's sort of seeing the, the limits of his own experience in a really real way, which is interesting. Um, but yes, I had a lot to draw on. I not only went to a school like this and remember the men who taught there, all men like this, but I grew up around a lot of academics and, and professors and teachers. Everybody in my family's teachers going back oh, gener really? yeah, a couple generations. Yeah. Was it a boarding school? You stayed there? I did not live there. I was a day student there, which is also its own weird yeah. thing and a weird perspective on a place like that. Um, I can't imagine what it's like living at one of those places with people like this, <laughs> being trapped <laughs> with a guy like this all the time. It's just crazy. It's really crazy. So I didn't quite have the depth of that experience, but yeah. Yeah, I, I know that it's a common thing, but it just seems so strange to me. It is strange, and those places are strange. And I went to one of those places only about 10 years after this movie takes place. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, it was still, they're, I can't imagine they're the same anymore. They, they can't be, but they're all based on this sort of British boarding school thing. And mm -hmm. so it's all this kind of rough, rough, rigorous, strict, you know, the, the pedagogy's mean-spirited yes. in some ways because that's how you're going to teach people, you know. So it's, it's a, they were rough places, mm. yeah. Um, I want to talk about this amazing cast you're surrounded with, uh, starting with Dominic Sessa, uh -huh. who plays Angus Tully. Um, and I believe this is his first professional acting job ever. It's like practically his first acting job oh, ever. So I mean, he, he, was, he was a student at one of the schools that we were shooting at. We shot at five different schools to create the one Barton School. And he was a student at Deerfield Academy. And he'd been like a hockey player or something. He got injured, and he took some time off, and so he did a play or two. Because he was like, oh, I'll try to do, do a play. And so then, I don't know, he saw like a flyer in the dining hall or something that said that they were going to look at, because they'd looked at 800, they had 800 submissions of actors. And I don't know how many Alexander saw, but Susan Shopmaker had seen all these guys. And, 
and it, he was not he couldn't find the kid mm. you know and it was a it was a guy who was a good he was good but he still wasn't satisfied and then this kid came into an audition at the school thinking he was just going to get like a an extra part yeah. he was going to sit at a desk or something and he got he got the part wow yeah at what point in the process did did you meet him because i have to imagine there was a chemistry read of some sort fairly early i mean i remember alexander finally because i kept saying so who's going to play the kid and he was like i don't know i don't know <laughs> i was like jesus man we're like getting really close you should know who's going <laughs> to play it and um it was pretty close we were only like maybe like a month or so oh out God. from the thing and he said this kid just came in you should and he's and i said let me see the tape I haven't, it's, it's, it's great working with him because he does this with you. He'll yeah. show you stuff. He'll conclude you, which a lot of people don't. And so I looked at it, and he did the scenes, and he did the scenes good. But they also just sat him down and talked to him. And he talked about his father who died when he was 14. And the kid was magnetic watching him. His face was amazing. And I thought, he looks like he's from the 70s. You know, and he seems like a period face, and he seems like, and there was so much going on in him. And it just, I thought, and I was like, but this has got to be the kid. Yeah. And he was like, but the kid's never done anything. I was like, I don't care. That's got to be the kid. And, and he went with it. He took the risk. And I think, you know, the movie's supposed to be a 70s movie. So it was like, he did the 70s thing, and he went with, he took the risk. Mm -hmm. And he was like, the hell with it. I'm just going to put the kid in who's never done anything. Do you remember the first time you read with him? I said, could I read with him? Because Alexander was like, I don't know. What, is he going to be able to do it? And I was like, I think he will. Can I just read with him? So it was just me and him Zooming. Oh, and Zoom. just me and, yeah, we had to Zoom. We couldn't, you know, it was, it was still COVID-y. And so I got on there with him. And uh, he was just, I liked him so much. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, God, I hope he does the scenes well right now because I like this kid so much. <laughs> You know, I was like, I just want to hang out with this kid. He's really oh. awesome. He reminded me a little bit of my son, a little bit. And I was like, oh, God, this kid is so great. And he read some of these, he read one of these monologues, the monologue he has with his father, where he's telling his father, I'm in the chess club, and all this stuff. And he did it, he did it good. And I said, you know, just do it again. And now just, just think, everything's good. You just want him to be happy. Everything's good. And the kid fucking read it so beautifully. And I was like, this has to be the kid. And I went back to Alexander and said, no, this kid can do it. No problem. He doesn't even need much, just the tiniest little notes. And he just runs with it. He's a natural. Wow. Yeah. Was Alexander on that Zoom? or he well, just? Then we did another one. Oh, okay. With the other kid and with, we did both of them. And mm -hmm. right after we did the other kid and then we did Dom and Alexander said, well, Dominic, you know, he has this funny sort of manner. He said, your life is going to change a great deal now <laughs> because I'm going to ask you, would you like to be in my movie? Which he does. He's so Midwestern that yeah, he'll be yeah, like, yeah. would you like to be in my movie? And so, yeah, he offered it to him right there. Wow, the that's yeah. amazing. It was amazing. Do you, was Dominic intimidated by you? Did, it was by me? Yes. What's intim Nothing's in Look at me. I'm not intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is intimidating? No, he, he you know, he was, he was... He was nervous, but he wasn't scared. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was like he was excited. And he, but he's so, he's so smart and watchful. And he was just like, and no, I, he, he, was, he just took to it really, really easily. You know? And, and I, D Divine is great, too. And I think it was good, to, the two of us. And you know, we were just so enchanted with the kid that I think he felt very comfortable. And, yeah. and Alexander creates this incredibly warm, intimate, environment so it's like i think he just like i said he's nervous but not scared uh, yes in addition to dominic you have th this whole cast is fantastic you have davine joy randolph yeah. um carrie preston yeah. you just just like a lineup of greats um and i believe the role was written for davine as well with her i don't know but yeah. I, he it definitely she was in my yeah. he was who was who he wanted the, from the dolomite you know which she's great in he was really really kind of fixated on her I think, again, it was like, do you think she'll do it? And I was like, yeah, I think she'll do it, man. You know, it's very funny. I mean, some of your best scenes are with her. Yeah. And I, again, again, the chemistry, so much that just goes unsaid. You believe these people have known each other for a long time. And I always think it's weird to put two 
people in a room and say like act like you've known each other for 20 years you like you've known each other have sex right now yeah. you know what i mean it's like well, I've, done, I've done that i've just met somebody right then and it's like then we just have to be having sex you know what i mean it's crazy i think Catherine um, hahn told me she like their first scene she was pantsless yes she had yes. no pants on. <laughs> yeah <laughs> no totally lives. no i did a thing with with liz marvel elizabeth marvel this not great movie and we had to I met her i'd never met her before in my life and we had to then be making love in a bed and it was like but you know it's 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 the job yeah. you know, it's what the job is I, you know what i mean and it's like it's the job you know they, they can't do anything to like m let you meet before or, or is this not in a little movie like yeah, that you know okay. this was this little tiny low budget thing and again i think they cast her at the last minute you know but well, it was great it was totally great it all was nice and decorous and it went fine you know but it's crazy what you have to do I you guess know. that's where acting comes in. Yeah. I mean, have you ever... <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, people ask me about, like, chemistry, and I'm like, it's my job, mm -hmm. you know, is to, have, is to find chemistry with people. It's your job to connect with people. It's your job to, like, just viscerally connect. That's what we do. We're so, you know, so we're looking to do it all the time. And some people, it just happens more, yeah. you know? And some people, maybe it's more work. But it doesn't necessarily, some people, that sometimes the people it happens with, it doesn't necessarily show up on screen. That's what I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. it can definitely happen. Yeah, hour. and you hear about co-stars who hated each other and they have this amazing chemistry on screen. Yeah, I've had that happen. It's like, <laughs> I have, where you haven't necessarily gotten along great with the person, yeah. but it looks great on camera, you know, you're fooling people. Do you, is there any rhyme or reason to it, or have you been surprised yourself? I've been surprised myself yeah. sometimes because I'm like, this can't possibly look like we like each other, <laughs> you know. And then I and, and, and then I look at it and I'm like, oh, it looks like we like each other. It looks like <laughs> we've known each other forever. But the, but Devine was one of those people where I didn't. We didn't have to talk about anything. Yeah. Really, we didn't have to. She just. It, it was one of those things, and ho uh, hopefully it comes across on camera. Yeah, she's just automatically. We felt very much. I think we're similar in some mm -hmm. ways about the way we thinks about things and the way we approach things. There's some similarity too. So you both have the theater background. I think That's there's true. a certain camaraderie that 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 develops amongst that. Yeah. Yeah. Just a way of thinking about things too. I mean, it's like she she thinks of it in interesting ways that mm -hmm. seem similar. Yeah, she's she's fantastic, and she's incredibly inventive and available and emotionally. I mean, way more than I am. So uh, being with somebody like that is always keeping me alive and cycling through stuff in a very exciting way. She's fantastic. As someone who's been doing this for a while, what's it like working with someone like Dominic, who's brand new to this? Do you do you find you're actually learning things from him? Yeah, I mean, I was reminded of things watching him, you know, with the energy of somebody so fresh to it again was really exciting, you know? It's like, I've been doing this for a long time, and it's, I, you can get a little bit set in your ways, you know? And he was very bold about things sometimes, which was great, but he was also very thoughtful in a way that I cannot be sometimes. Mm -hmm. I can get very sort of like concerned with getting it done, getting in and getting it done, and a little bit of a trained dog, you know what I mean? I'm a little bit of like, I'll do the thing, now what do you want me to do? Now where do you want me to go? You got something for, you You know? But he would, sometimes I, he would stop me in my tracks because he would start talking about it in a very, very thoughtful way, you know? And I don't let myself do that sometimes. I'm afraid really? to do that. I don't want to think or talk about it too much. But it's like, get over it. Talk about <laughs> it. You know what I mean? It's not a big deal. Talk about it sometimes, you know? It's not going to kill it. It's not going to, like, ruin it. Yeah. I, I'm still, I still have that thing of, like, it's going to ruin it if we talk about it too right, much. Right, right. Destroy the mystery. Yeah, but it's not true. And it's like, and he really had this thoughtful approach sometimes that was lovely and reminded me, like, I can slow down sometimes, yeah. you know? I mean it as the highest compliment to say that the dialogue in this movie sounds so organic and fresh that I wondered if there was any improvisation, because I don't think there generally is on Alexander's sets, but... No, he wants you pretty much word perfect. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do any improvising, you do it in the sort of rehearsal period beforehand. It's about two weeks beforehand. If you want to screw around with stuff, then he'll put it in the script. He's not, he's open to doing things. If, if something pops out or whatever, something comes out, he might, he might let, it, let it stay there. But no, it's all written down. I'm glad it seems like we're making it up. Yeah, but I yeah. couldn't, yeah, no, I couldn't make that stuff up. That stuff is complicated. <laughs> not even those insults? Come no, on. they're incredibly, <laughs> they're fantastically like Baroque. I mean, yes. they're really hilarious, you know? And <laughs> they were fun to do, you know, and the guy is enjoying it. The yeah. guy thinks he's yeah. the guy thinks he's hilarious, you know, coming out with these elaborate insults and stuff. Yeah. <laughs>
and and we've discussed this before, but I truly believe he sits at home at night and comes up with those. Oh yes, they are no, not off the does. top of his head. No, no, no. <laughs> he's got them sitting. He's just he's just delighting sitting at yes. home with his pipe, but delighting in this. And the next time he's going to unload on that kid in the yeah. classroom. Yeah, no, he's really, really he's a very bizarre character. <laughs> <laughs> Just waiting for a chance to get that exactly. zinger out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so you did work with Alexander 20 years ago on Sideways, and he was already a master filmmaker then. Um, what was it like reuniting after all this time? Did you find he had changed much, or it was pretty much the same rhythm? It was just, Well, I mean, he, it was the same. He was... Back then, he was incredibly relaxed. I mean, he's mellowed somewhat with age. You know what I mean? There's just that, there's just that natural change with age. He's more, he's even more at ease than he already was. It's also exhaustion. Yeah, that <laughs> too. Well, I, I'm completely exhausted. I, I'm, I'm all worn out. And but, it, it, it the interesting thing was the the kind of technical aspect of it was different. It's like he, it was a different mode for this movie. So he was different in that way. He was still the same relaxed, open guy and everything. But Sideways was more kind of loose. You know, we had multiple cameras, two cameras shooting stuff and everybody's might. So we can, it's like you're playing a theater scene, you know, and, and you can talk over each other and it's kind of messy. You know, this was a 70s movie. So he shot it like a 70s movie. So it was much more formal. So it was much more, take, take, angle, angle, and it was much more kind of like formal. Wow. And the, nobody was mic'd, couldn't talk over each other. And I was a little bit at first thrown by that because I thought it was going to be the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and he had a real concern about the pace of this, which he didn't with Sideways. He kind of let us just, you know, just sort of do whatever, mm. you know. But this was much more, it was a little bit more, it was great though, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. You know? Well, it's such a specific tone, and, you know, everyone has to be on the same page. And I, I don't know if it was, you know, in, I'm sure it was partially in the script, but also in the direction and even in the editing, kind of fine, walking that fine balance, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, was it a constant, was he, you know, always reminding you about the tone? Well, yeah, I mean, it's in the script, I gotta say. I mean, that's a really boring thing to say, but it really is in the script. You could feel it and see it, you know, and having worked with him before, he is a master sort of restraint. He's always mm -hmm. undercutting things, so you sort of know that, but he's also... You know, he's got the incredibly great skill of finding the right people for the part. He finds exactly the right people for the part and the right kinds of actors. And so he then does the really amazing thing of trusting you to do your yeah. job, which nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a miracle how, how rare that is, you know. But he finds the right person. And he likes, he likes people that are, not, uh, their baseline have a kind of sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Things come out of humor. And, and you'll put humor into the sad things. So he, he finds people who kind of do maybe undercut stuff naturally, too. Uh, so what did end up being the biggest challenge of making the film or playing Paul? Well, I, I think exactly what you just said, too, was like I, didn't, I wanted to make sure that somewhat early on you knew this guy wasn't a bad guy, but I couldn't tip my hand too much. But it, again, it's in the script. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go in and talk that I had master. He's right. He's not wrong about the stuff he's saying. You know, and the stuff when he, when he sort of blows up at that kid, when the, the little racist kid and stuff like that, there's things telling you he's not a bad guy. And I just, I didn't, I wanted to make sure that early on you, you, you liked him in some way. Yeah. So that it was like, so that was tricky. And I was always like, because I, I have to play a lot of people like this. You know, I play a lot of tricky, complicated people like this. And sometimes I feel like I sometimes overplay my hand and make them too unlikable. Mm. And I was like, I don't want this guy to be too, I want to make sure early on you feel something about him that's, that's not so off-putting, you know. Why do you think you're the guy that people go to when they want, you know? <laughs> they, they when they want somebody who smells like fish? Yeah. <laughs> No, someone. I don't know. Everybody asks me this. Yeah. And I, people ask me this, and I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if it's that thing, if it's something some people saw me do early on and they yeah. want to see you do it again. Like, I don't know. Or whether it's something that I attract or whether it's just, I don't know. Or whether it's something I bring to things. I, I really don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Why I mean, I thinking about guys. some of your early roles, it's like, no, there was, there, I couldn't find many things really redeeming in the character in private parts, but. Uh, 
something like the negotiator we do love that guy even though he's kind of he's kind of obnoxious yeah, yeah. He's sketchy and obnoxious <laughs> yeah no i mean it's a tricky thing to do and i guess i don't know what it is whether it's just people think okay he does that well i don't know i really don't know why it's not a bad guys. thing to be typecast no it's as. not it's complicated yeah. people it's not it's a good yeah. thing to be yeah. yeah yeah so people have really fallen in love with this film what, what do you have any theories on why it struck such a chord well, I think that um, Alexander doesn't like people saying it's cozy. He's, he gets curmudgeonly about people saying I it's warm. I actually think, think that's a weird word for it. Well, there's something intimate about it at sure. least. You know what I mean? Maybe maybe that's a better word. And it's something, and I think it's actually also a deeply compassionate movie and a deeply a movie about empathy and a movie about people just helping each other over a hump. You know what I mean? And, and people helping each other move forward a step. And it's just, everything is so <laughs> crazy right now in the world. And it's like anything that gives you this feeling of sort of like, it's a gentle movie, you know, in a lot of ways. And I think the Christmas thing is always nice, you yeah. know. But it hits, it hits notes of melancholy, it hits notes of funny. But I think it's just, it's always good to be reminded of basic empathy. And people just finding common humanity i mean there's nothing wrong with that and it's like i think maybe that's what people are finding about it maybe something like that i wouldn't use the word cozy but i don't know if you've ever heard the term cottage core <laughs> no oh okay no. <laughs> we no, not to come off too cool but in that sounds games, more cozy than like that sounds well, like super cozy that's kind of the idea it's uh -huh. like something that you put you wrap yourself in a quilt and, yeah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's like that danish word hygge have you well, heard Huga? Huga. Do you know Huga? Huga is like it's great. It's like the Danish national concept. It's like the Danish really? national characteristic. It, that's what it is. It's like cozy. It's really? all like yeah, well, nice big old Danish socks and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, yeah, and you like mulled wine cocoa. and yes, stuff exactly, like that. Yeah, it's exactly. all that stuff. And so it's like that thing we associate with Scandinavians. You know what I mean? It's like that kind of oh, yeah. they, they are the sweater and the reindeer and all that <laughs> stuff and stuff. So it's like Huga. Yeah, Huga. 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 Okay, I I'm think it's who. I, what the hell do I know? I'm not Danish. Um, <laughs> Huga, I think. Yeah. I'm going to use that instead Huga. of cottage. Cottage core is really more of a like a board game term if you're like playing a game about quilting. <laughs> um, Are I there know. games about quilting? Like I'm a board so, game about quilting? I'm so cool. Yeah. You have no <laughs> idea. They're super cool. I go to gaming conventions and okay. play board games about quilts. Yes. Yeah, I know, right? I'm sorely tempted to take this in a <laughs> severe left turn <laughs> and ask you what the hell kind of a game would like what's the game? It's really cool. Um you It's you making a quilt. What's the game? <laughs> <laughs> You collect. You're buttons. fucking with the other quilt makers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yes. I'm gonna you're do. I'm gonna do a double stitch on this one. You're joking, <laughs> but you're trying to steal their buttons. <laughs> That sounds like a euphemism for something. <laughs> That's hilarious. You're trying to build the best quilt. Okay. Yeah, patchwork, it's called. So you're building your own quilt, or you're building. Yes, with, but you're you competing gotta, with You got to beat them. You got to put yes. more things together. Yes. Oh. And, yeah. Well, I could really get into and it. And there's a convention for just this. Well, no, not just this. For many games, okay. I also entered a Uno tournament. So uh, yeah. Uno uh, <laughs> tournament was promptly kicked Is out by like a ten-year-old. Is it like a pot thrower game? Is it like a game for people like throwing pots and stuff like that? Well, there was a squid game. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> amazing. I'm sure anything's possible. It's, it's sounds amazing. Sounds four amazing. Four days. Yeah, they, yeah, they come awesome. up with everything. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I don't want you all to be intimidated by how cool I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I would actually love to go back to the beginning of your career and sort of ask. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was there a moment that you sort of knew you wanted to be an actor? Did you have that you know lightning bolt moment? I mean, I I don't know. It's hard to say. People ask me that. I mean, I always enjoyed play acting. You know, I always enjoyed to see a movie and I wanted to be the guy in the movie. I can remember when I was a kid, I saw that not very good Moby Dick movie with Gregory, Gregory Peck. Peck. Oh, yeah. There you go. And I was like, oh, I, want a, I want a peg leg. And I made like a... <laughs> I made a peg leg out of like brown construction paper. And I made like a hat and I was like walking around the house, you know. I was doing shit like that. And, and like the mummy, the mummy, like wrapping myself up in toilet paper and stuff like that. Monster stuff actually was a lot of what it was. So I was always into it. And so I had to do it like in the grade school play, whatever the hell it was, playing a tree. I was, 
psyched out of my mind to play the tree. Did everybody see this little kid who's doing door opener number three? Oh, the little yes. British kid? Fantastic, that kid. You know, and it's like, that's what it was like. I just was like, yeah, I don't even care what I was doing. So I was really into it. But I remember doing a play in high school, the only play I did in high school. And because I was, you know, I didn't, it was like kind of uncool or something. I just didn't do it in high school. And I can remember having this jolting experience because I, I didn't have the most delightful time in high school. And something about that, and it wasn't just the, the reception of it and stuff. There was something really transcendent about it that really just stuck in my head. And I couldn't shake it. I thought about doing other things. And I, I was always in the back of my head going, yeah, but I, I can't really do that. You know? And then I just, I don't know. It's hard. I, I, don't, I didn't have that moment except maybe that time in high school doing a play. What was the play? It was a really weird play. And some kid had a project he was doing, and it was this John Steinbeck thing. Uh, and you know, like, Of Mice and Men is written like a play. It's yeah. all dialogue. He wrote another thing called Burning Bright. You've never heard of it because it's not that great. <laughs> and, and it's a really peculiar play, sort of. And it was that. I don't know. This kid was doing as a project or something. And what so high school did you go to? I went to one of these prep schools. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I went to one of these prep schools where they're like, let's do John Steinbeck's Burning Bright. <laughs> Philip, you will do John Steinbeck's Burning Bright. You know, so this kid, I don't know, he got assigned it or something. And wow. so I, you know, and I, I was sort of, didn't know what the hell quite to do with myself in high school. And I remember seeing a poster and I was like, oh, that sounds cool, I'll go in for a play. I don't know why that struck my fancy. Maybe I'd read something by Steinbeck or something. I was like, that, that must be good. That's Steinbeck. That's going to be quality. And uh, I got into it miraculously. I didn't think I would. And then, yeah. Well, uh, you had to know that this was a career path because you went to Yale School of Drama. By then, Well, eventually I did, yeah. yeah. Once I got out of college, because then I went, when I was in college, I, I majored in all different kinds of things. I kept changing my major. Never a theater major, but I kept doing theater as an extracurricular thing all the time. And still coming out of college going, oh, I'm going to be an academic or something. I don't know what I'm going to do. But, uh, you know, it was always in the back of my head. And I moved out to Seattle because I had a girlfriend from out there. And again, I was like, I'm going to try to do animation. Maybe I'll apply to it. And I was still doing theater stuff on the side all the time because it's really what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so I finally... When I started through circum various circumstances, making a very low-key living as an actor out there, which you could do in yes. Seattle in the, in the early 90s, I thought, I should stop kidding myself. This is what I want to do. This is ridiculous. Of course I want to do this. I've always wanted to do this. And is that when you then went to Yale School of Drama? Yes. I'd been out in Seattle for about three years or mm. so. And I thought, well, I should go back to learn what the hell it is I'm doing because I really <laughs> don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And I should have a degree in case, you know, I can teach it if I can't actually do it. You know? How did your family of academics feel about you pursuing acting? Well, I don't, they were very artsy. It was a very yeah. artsy family, you know, so, and it was an artsy environment and stuff. So nobody was telling me I shouldn't do it. I have an older brother who's an actor. He teaches acting now at Temple. That's the other bizarre thing. My brother was an actor, and I think I kept looking at going, yeah, but I can't do that. Like, he can do wow. that. I can't do that. You know, it was weird. Um, my father died right after I got out of college, which I think is one of the things that impelled me to move. Yeah. I was very destabilized by it. My father never saw me act except a couple of plays in college. And, but something about that really shook me in some way mm -hmm. and made me, I mean, he was very young. My father was 50 years old. And so it was like, I was like, I, I don't know, but whatever I do, I, it's got to work. I got to do something that works and I should do something that I really want to do because you can go like that, mm -hmm. you know, so. I don't actually know uh, at the Yale School of Drama, is there a particular method or style they teach or is it sort of open? I don't know what they teach now. Yeah. I mean, when I was there, it was a kind of basic like Stanislavski thing with this guy, Earl Gister, who was a really great teacher. Um, basic sort of thing yeah. like that, yeah, yeah. Um, and you, it seems like you started working fairly quickly after graduating from Yale. Did you ever have to take any survival jobs? Uh, no, in Seattle I did. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, when I lived in Seattle, I, I had to take a couple of jobs like that. But once I got out of the drama school, again, I was making a very, very bare existence, but I happened to live in a rent-stabilized apartment. What? So Tell me you I still was, have it. No. No. <laughs> no. 
No, I fucked that up. I sold it. <laughs> I still look at it and I'm like, what the hell was I thinking? Because it's still, this building is still rents. It's got to be one of the only ones in New York City wow. anymore. So I, I, I was living with a woman and we were living in a rent stabilized apartment. So I was able to survive on the, the little things I was getting and doing theater and stuff like that. So I survived without having to do that. Yeah. But in Seattle, you had to. Like yeah, in Seattle, I sold juice makers with a guy. We would go to <laughs> malls and sell juice makers. I didn't do much of the selling, believe me. I unloaded the van and shit like that. Uh, I'd wash dishes in a place for a little while in a restaurant. Ooh, was it Flaky Jake's? Uh, no, it was, um, it was um, what the fuck was it called? Flaky Jake's. I, I remember love that Flaky place. Flaky Jake's. It was a fish place. and I, It was called like Ocean was. City. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. There you go. It all makes sense now. It's called like, it all makes sense. It's called like Ocean City or something. It was called Ocean City or something like that. Oh, is it in the remember. Pike Marketplace? Uh, it was up from there. It was okay. up from there on First Avenue, right up from that whole mall area, a couple of blocks up. Um, I did a thing with a, one. It, there was an Ivar's that was opening. Remember Ivar's? Oh yes. Yeah, and I wore like a, a styrofoam fish costume for about two days, <laughs> handing out flyers, and then I was like. Even I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Even I cannot do this. So it's things like that. But I was, you know, as you, I mean, out in Seattle, it was not, you could make a very yeah. bare living, but you could do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, once you graduated from Yale School of Drama, I'm really curious about your experience auditioning. Because it, like I said, it seems like you started working pretty quickly. Um, and I'm guessing that you're good at it. It's a very different skill from acting. It is a very different skill. I liked it. Whether I was good or not, I don't know, but I actually liked auditioning. Really? Yeah. It was weird. I kind of found it really like a charge. I found it really like adrenally, like it was just exciting in some weird way. It was like being shot out of a cannon. I always found it really kind of exciting. It was a sprint, sort of. You were like, this. I, got, I don't have a lot of time to do this. And I always felt like, I don't know what the hell these people are looking for. I don't know what the hell these people are going to do. I'm probably not going to get it. So this is my one chance to do what I want to do with it, you know? So I was like, so I'm going to go in there and just do whatever crazy shit I feel like doing, you know? And I did a lot of crazy stuff, and it was, I found it exciting. I liked it, actually. And so I, it's not like I thought I was tremendous, but I rarely walked out of there going, that went terrible. Mm. I walked out of there a lot of times just being like, that was hilarious. I can't believe I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, that was crazy. That was fun, man. That was... I mean, I just was so up my own ass in a way. I don't know that I just was, I was kind of, uh, I don't know. It was an oblivion in yeah. some way. I just was doing what I wanted to do. If they wanted to direct me, fantastic. You know, so I, I, I don't know if I was good at it, but I liked it. I actually just remembered something and I, I forget what I had for breakfast today, so I can't believe I remember this. Amazing. But I think you once told me about your worst audition. To, oh, uh, really? Was it for like America's Most Wanted? Oh, that was one of the weirdest auditions I ever yeah. had. I think that was the first audition I ever had. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was really, really weird. And that was in Seattle. Oh. Yeah, and that was for America's Most Wanted, when America's Most Wanted was on. And I evidently, I looked exactly like some bank-robbing child molester. That's what Both, I Both, not just child molester, bank-robbing child molester. <laughs> And I remember Double going, threat. and I looked like the guy. And I, they showed me, I was like, oh, I got this. I look exactly <laughs> like the guy. I was like, I have to do shit. I'll just walk in there, and they're going to be like, you're the guy. You know, because I was like, I look exactly like the guy. It was a very peculiar audition. I remember telling you about yeah. this. I went in this weird windowless room with this guy in a bad sweater, or this weird guy in a sweater, who was incredibly serious about it. And I was like... <laughs> oh, maybe I will have to actually sharpen up here. Maybe I won't just fly on my good looks with this guy. And, and then he was like, we're going to improvise. I was like, yeah, be fucking kidding me. We're going to improvise this? <laughs> and so we started doing this very peculiar improv. And my character's name was Abe or something like that. And so he was playing my girlfriend. And he was all like, Abe... You know, it was, it was like, Abe, I want some more. You got to go get me some more whiskey. And I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, sweetheart, what do you want? You know, all this stuff. And it was all this. And then he was like, and then there was some whole thing. Somebody was coming in who was going to try to kill us. He was like, oh, they're coming in. You got to run. Oh, they're coming up the stairs. And I was like, holy shit. And I'm running around the room. 
And she says, look, look, they're, at, they're at the window. And I'm like running to the window. There's no window. And I'm like, oh my God, like looking out the window. And shit, like this the guy's yelling all this shit at me. And I'm running around the room. And he's like, oh, find your gun, get your gun. And I'm like, I got my gun, I got my gun. And like, I don't know. And I'm like, is this really going to be in America's Most Wanted? Like this. And then he's like, he's in the room, he's in the room. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, he's in the room. And he goes, he shoots you. And I go, yeah, and I go flying across the room. And I like hit the radiator and shit, and I like land on the ground. I didn't get the part. I was like, dude, I almost broke my arm on the fucking radiator. And I was like, I look like the guy. I was like, really? I didn't get the part? And I didn't get the part. <laughs> that was my first, I don't know if I was my, but again, exciting. I had a really good time. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. And the guy was so hilarious. And there was kind of bad sweater and a beard and these glasses. And he was very kind of like, when I came in, he was very serious. serious. But the way he suddenly turned into my girlfriend, it was just like, he was like, Abe, why are you? And I was like, holy shit. I was like, this guy's amazing. Are you going to play the girlfriend? Right. In this? I just was like, the whole thing was bananas. <laughs> really bananas, but didn't get that one. You know, they say sometimes your reader doesn't... I haven't told that story in many years. <laughs> I haven't thought that in a long time. I didn't even know about all that stuff. I just remember you being really offended that you looked just like the guy. And Who are you going to find to play this? You know what I mean? <laughs> Did you ever watch the episode? No, you, yeah. fuck that. <laughs> fuck them. <laughs> Fuck them, they don't want me to play the <laughs> child molesting bank robber. <laughs> what I'm going to find that guy now. <laughs> I should have played Abe, motherfucker. <laughs> what if it turned out to be the casting director? Yeah, that would yeah. be amazing. Yeah. No, I don't know. He, was, he had something to do with it. He was a director or something. I feel like I remember somebody. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like he was giving you a lot. I hear a lot oh, of times. Oh, fuck yeah. No, yeah. he was giving me a ton. He was yeah. amazing. Too much. I was like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Jesus, man. Take it easy. There's no windows, man. What do you want me to do? <laughs> I really pray if that tape is out there somewhere. Oh, God. Someone finds that's a thought. it. I'm going to tell you something that, 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 that's funny to me, too. I, that doesn't mean as much here in Los Angeles, but I've never been on Law & Order. What? I'm the only New York actor. I don't think I exist, actually, because I've never been on Law & Order. Isn't that funny? I auditioned for that motherfucker so yes. many times. <laughs> and there's been like, what, 27 iterations of that show? Never on a single one of them, man. I you know, know people who have been on it several times. Several times characters. playing different things. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you, just you, wanted to get that off my chest as well. So... So are you available now if they call? I'm available. Yeah, I'm available now. I'm available any time to be on Law & Order. <laughs> I love Law & Order. I never was on Law & Order. <laughs> Got to tick that box. Yeah, shit, yeah. <laughs> So what was your, your first time in front of a camera like? Because they don't teach you, and maybe they do now, but they didn't teach you in classes like how to act no. when there's a camera in your face. No. It was that it was that past midnight. I think I did something before that that was very small though. I just sat at a bar so it didn't seem like I think I feel like the thing that that past midnight thing was the first real thing I remember doing in front of a camera. And I no, I had no clue. And it was and people were saying things to me. I didn't know what they were talking. First of all, I got there and I waited for hours. Mm. And I was like, You gotta be kidding me, isn't this like <laughs> hours? And I was supposed to be in a stable. I was a stable hand. You know, and I was like, and I walk I in, the guy's like, movie. you ever been around a horse? I'm like, not much, dude, no. And he's like, here, you're going you're gonna to brush in the horse. I'm like, seriously? You're putting me in this little pen with a horse like this? He's like, don't, if you walk behind the horse, walk real close to him, I'm like, because he'll kick you. I'm like, really? This is fucking crazy. <laughs> and so I had to do all that stuff. And, but it was all like, I remember people being like, you know, your eye line. Eye line's over here. I was like, yeah, of course. I know that. Of course, my eye line's over there. I had no idea what they were talking about. And, and um, the mark and everything. And they were like, you get your marks? I'm like, no, I know. I don't take it easy. I know. I'm just working here. <laughs> and, but, and I do remember we shot it. You know, you shot sort of master shots and then you're a little closer and all that stuff. And then two shots. And I was like, oh, this, is, this is a piece of cake. And then the thing comes in for close up. And I remember mm. being like, whoa. I just like, that thing is really close. And I was like, and where's the woman? And she's behind the camera. And I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. 
And it, was, it took me a long time to get used to that. I was going to say, when did yeah. you finally start to feel comfortable? I think I did a movie. I didn't do a lot of movies of any real substance for a while. It was sort of that Howard Stern thing I started yeah. feeling comfortable, but I did a movie after that called um, Winchell, which oh, was yeah. a HBO movie with Stanley Tucci playing Walter Winchell. <clears throat> and he was really great, because I still didn't know what the fuck I was doing in a lot of ways, and he was very helpful to me, because he could tell I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. <laughs> and um, that's when I can remember starting to feel like I'm forgetting about it, and I'm just seeing him, because he was such a, mm -hmm. such a great actor, and he's such a lovely guy. So that is what sort of calmed me down a little bit. Yeah. But I did a lot of stuff not knowing what the hell I was doing. <laughs> yeah, lots. By the way, Italians also love Stanley Tucci. Why not? Yeah. My God, he's like <laughs> the best Italian alive, that guy. Uh, you did have this incredible year in 1997 through 1998 where you were in everything, like Private Parts, My Best Friend's Wedding, uh. The Truman Show, Saving Private Ryan, all back to back. Uh. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Um, did, did I didn't you realize I was all one year? Wow. Well, 77, 97 to 98. Oh, boy, 77. Sorry. Yeah, Jesus. I'm, <laughs> not I'm not that far again. <clears throat> were you aware at the time that you were sort of hitting your stride or in a groove? No, not really. I mean, it's like it was work, you know, and it was a lot of great stuff. And I still, in some way, I was doing theater. And I, in some way, I thought that, but that's really what I'm going to do. This other stuff's not going to pan out. You know, I'm just I'm having some lucky streak. You know, I, I didn't think it was going to. So no, I wasn't really. I wasn't really thinking that. It was great work. I was. I was loving it. I was doing all kinds of fun stuff. But some part of me was always just like, well, this is not going to last or anything. You know, and, and I'm going to do theater stuff. Probably. I had no. I had no plan or conception of anything. So it was like, you know, a very. I was doing wonderful stuff though. Lucky, lucky, lucky. You know. Do you still get that feeling that like it's not going to last? Because I've heard so many actors do. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I'm always just like, this is it. I'm, this is it. No, but I'm going to get found out and nobody's going to hire me uh -uh. anymore. No, totally. I mean, I think a lot of actors are Yeah, like yeah. That. Imposter yeah. syndrome is very real. Yeah, big real. time. Big time. Uh, we have a question from Mark Flores. I apologize if I mispronounce anyone's name. Um, we are getting to that point. I believe this was your first lead role in a movie. American Splendor is one of the best films I've ever seen. Oh, wow. That's nice. Did you know how you would play Harvey? Harvey is in quotes. I love that. From the start, or did the director guide you? No, I mean that was it was um, yeah, sort of. I that was a tricky thing to do because you knew you had to imitate him in some way. It wasn't mm -hmm. just you couldn't get away with sort of like, well, I'll do a kind of general sense of him. You can actually see him. No, they kind of left me in my own devices a little bit, and. Um, I, s I looked at tape of him and stuff like that. The key thing to that was that voice thing. Yeah. It was the whole, that was when I could find that thing, I was like, oh, this feels like the guy. Um, but no, they left me in my own devices a lot. They were great directors too, those two. Bob Harvey and Picard, um, yeah. also someone who is odiferous. Because <laughs> uh, one of my favorite lines <laughs> is when uh, uh, Hope Davis is talking about the lines yeah. that emanate off him. Yeah. You, you say, they're motion lines. The motion I'm an lines. Guy. She, says, she says they look like stink lines. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All the kind of wavy lines. <laughs> kind of motion lines. That's I'm right. I'm an active yeah. guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's favorite right. lines of all time. Yeah. Uh, we also have a question from Jeff about American Splendor. Well, first he wants to know what's wrong with Merlot. Don't ask me. I, it's uh, don't ask me. I actually asked Alexander this finally. After all, I never asked him like why really? Merlot, and he was like, "Well, it was in the book," you know. And I was like, "That's really why." And he was like, oh. "I I have no idea. I know yeah. nothing about wine." So it's like, no, uh, you don't. I remember thing. you. Yeah. I don't even know which color. What thing is what color? You know what I mean? The other day somebody was like getting a Chianti, and I was like, "Is that white?" Or is that they were like it's red, dumbass, and I was like, eh, of course it's red. You know, I don't know anything about them, no. So I don't know Merlot. I don't know. So in my mind, I'm like, there must be some low rent wine. I don't know. <laughs> and so, yeah, but it, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know if you've been to Solving lately, but you know they still have these thriving sideways tours. That's and what I'm told. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. great. It really revitalized the area. I'm told, yeah. except for the Merlot growers, <laughs> but but. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the rest of it, it really revitalized everything. So Jeff's uh, question about American Splendor was, what was the hardest part of portraying Harvey Picard? I mean, the whole thing was hard because it, it felt like a lot of pressure, you know? It felt 
difficult. I, uh, I still think I was too much in some ways, but he was too much. Yeah. And, you know, and it's like, and it was tricky because also he was different in the movie. He's older and he'd been sick, so he was a different sort of guy. So it was tricky. All of it, everything about that was tricky. I loved it. You know, we didn't have much time. We only had about two weeks to shoot that movie. Wow. Yeah. And it was really fast. Um, but it was great. Yeah. It was fantastic. Uh, well, the whole thing was kind of hard. Oh, I I remember interviewing Harvey for that movie. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. I wasn't I wasn't qualified enough to interview you yet at the oh. time. So, what? Okay. so okay. I got Harvey, um, and it was it was actually uncanny. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. well, that's good. Well, good, 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 good. And how did that? I mean, the success of that movie. How did that sort of change your life and career? Were you were you aware of it at the time? Um. Yeah, it was a funny time. I mean, I was working, but then I, I had a sort of funny fallow period. Not much was going on, and um, but it definitely did. I don't. Uh, something must have changed for people's perception of me in some way, because I did get to go into audition for Sideways, mm. which I mean, I would sometimes get to go in on lead roles, but it was never going to happen, you know. And as far as I'm concerned, that wasn't ever going to happen. Um, uh, so, I mean, something changed in some way. I wasn't aware of it, but I, was, I went in for that, you know. I, I had always thought that Alexander had said he wanted you for that part. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've never really talked to him about it. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think, I think, again, I think he saw a million people. Oh, and really? I think I might have been one of the last guys that he saw or something. I mean, it took you 20 years to ask the Merlot question, so maybe you can <laughs> work up to know. asking yeah, about I that. Yeah, I will. Okay, I'll ask him. <laughs> I'll let you know. What was the process of booking the role? It was just an audition. Really? You know, yeah. I got the sides. I never read the script. I just got sides. Once I got one scene, and I didn't know what the, I knew nothing about yeah. the movie. I don't remember. It was a scene in the car, was a, one of the scenes in the car with Tom Church's character. I just went in and I was really excited to meet him because I loved Election and yeah. Susan Ruth. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to meet this guy. And I thought, what a nice guy. And I sat and I read the scene and he, and he said, well, that's very good. And he's got <laughs> such a funny manner. He says, would you mind reading this? And he handed me uh, a, some monologue. I don't remember what one. And I was like, okay. He was like, would you like some more time to study it? And I said, oh, I think I can do it. And read that and that was it. That was just the one audition? Yeah, and I left, and, and it was a long time. A lot of time went by, and for some reason I was out here. I don't know why. And my agent called me all crapping herself with excitement. <laughs> and she was like, Alexander Payne wants to meet you tonight because I, I, we think he wants you to do that movie. I was like, that thing I, what? I was like, that was months ago. I was like, I just figured that wasn't going to happen. She was like, oh, it's so exciting. And I said, well, I don't even know, like, what is it? She goes, it's one of the leads. I was like, what, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I was like, what? And so she said, he wants to meet, so I went to some Italian restaurant in, I don't know, Glendale or something. And I was like, went and met him, and I was really, the whole time I was just like, are you, I wanted to say to him, I'm like, are you crazy? Are you really gonna? <laughs> I was like, you know, and he was, did that thing. He was like, I wonder if you would like to do the movie with me. Oh. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah, so. Because I know everyone auditioned for that. George Clooney auditioned for Thomas Hayden Church's role. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Lots of people. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah when you said you went somewhere in Glendale, uh, Italian place in Glendale, I think it was Olive Garden. Because <laughs> that's, I just happen to know that's where the Olive Garden is. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm going to say it was the Olive Garden. I think that's a real, that makes for a better story. I don't should, remember where it was. But should yeah. have taken him to Italy. They love you there. But Italy didn't exist no, then, you're right. did it? You're yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it existed. We would have. Uh, so then in 2005, you earned your first Academy Award nomination for your role in Cinderella Man. And at this point, you've played quite a few real-life people. Uh, does that change your approach? Uh, it depends on the real life person, you know. I mean, if it's somebody that people know, it's like Harvey Picar, he's going to be in the movie, it's a little bit of a tricky thing. But, you know, in the end, it's always a character. You know, you, in the end, you got to do what's in the script. And you can, but, but as I say, you, you have some freedom. I mean, the guy in Cinderella Man, nobody knows who he is and what he was like. Mm -hmm. Although it was interesting to find footage of him and watch him a little bit and stuff oh, yeah. like that. But, you know, I'm also playing, you know, that's a, 
those are types in that movie. You know, it's like the big palooka boxer and his stalwart wife and his scrappy manager and stuff. You know, this is certain, you know what the thing is. You know, you know it's a kind of boxing movie, so you got to do that kind of thing. But so I didn't worry about it in that. But uh, other things I've done, it depends. Sometimes I'll do a lot of research. Sometimes not. It's but then it's always going to come down to the script, and that's going to really guide me in a lot of ways. And I don't know. He is a uh, an archetype, the character in Cinderella Man. But yeah. he actually did catch me off guard. There's a wonderful scene where his wife sort of explains everything he sacrificed. Yeah. And uh, I, I honestly did not see that coming. Yeah, he really did that, too, that guy. Wow. He was a sketchy guy. He was, okay. a very, he was a sketchy guy, which is not in the movie that he was a sketchy guy. And I remember being like, can we put the thing around? I was like, no, no, we're not putting, we're not putting the sketchy stuff in. This guy has to be a nice guy. But he did do all that. He did sell all his furniture for, wow. all, yeah, for the guy. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nancy Jo Saper, I think it is. Uh, wants to know, what is your method for preparing for the roles you play? Um, and was this character any different in your preparation? Thanks for being here. Yeah, no. I, I, it's a little bit of a different thing all the time. And I, it's really boring to say, but it is true that the only thing I'll do the same way every time, pretty much, is read the script a bazillion times. Just read it over and over and over and over and over again. If I have the time, uh, you know, if it's not something that's going to happen in a few days or something. Or still, I'll read it as many times as I can. Not just to sort of get the words inside me so it'll look like we're making them up. But, you know, because it's going to constantly spark my imagination off. Every time I read it, more stuff will it'll happen. They'll stay there probably internally for the most part and come out later. You know, I, to get to the point where I'm just not thinking about it as much as possible. It's boring, but it is, it, is a, it's, it is one thing I do. And then, I don't know, it's always going to be different. I don't know. And what draws you to a script or a project? Like, do you read a log line? Does someone recommend it to you? What, what will catch your attention? If I keep reading the script, I'm not kidding. If I keep turning the pages, if it's the story is interesting. No, I don't look at the log line or anything. I'll just take the script. I don't want to hear too much about it, and I'll just read it. And if it's something I keep going, this is interesting, and I never know what that's going to be, you know, then it's the, st I mean, it, it sounds hokey maybe, but it's got to be a good story, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like, the movie and the story are, are, are going to be what lasts. We'll put it over. We'll help put it over. And a great performance is a great performance. That's wonderful. But, but, but the movie has got to be good. The story has got to be interesting. Otherwise, the greatest acting doesn't matter. You know, it's just as you can have a great performance in a mediocre movie. Who cares? You know? Which is actually what I think they should give awards for. Because it's so much harder to be good in a mediocre that's, movie. That's actually really, yeah, that's right. hilarious. That's actually yeah. a really great idea. That's funny. <laughs> That's that. That's true. You're right. It is much harder. It is. Best performance in a bad movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I've, I don't know if I've done the best performance, but I've been in some bad movies. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, after Cinderella Man, you pretty much won every award possible for playing another real life figure in the miniseries, John Adams. Um, this might be your most. Yep, sure. Um, this is someone who is, you know, sort of recognizable, or we think he is because yeah, yeah, we have an yeah. image of him. Um, and honestly, after you played him, he sort of came back into the pop culture vernacular. He kind of did. Like, that was weird. It was weird. <laughs> it was weird. Yeah, he kind of did. Yeah. Well, it was, you know, it, it brought all that stuff back. And, you know, and he was, again, he wasn't, he's not George Washington. He's not Thomas Jefferson. He's not the guys we know so well. So I did have a certain amount of leeway because he's not a guy I, people have a lot of associations with, you know, and it's like, and he's kind of the most low key in some ways of those guys. Um, so I felt like I had a, a lot of room to, to, to play around with him, mm -hmm. you know, and again, who the hell knows what those guys really sounded like right. and all that stuff. And we, we worked on all that stuff and, Again, like I could do a lot of historical research, but at a certain point I was like, this is too, I have to stop because it's, I have to do what's in the script, you know, because otherwise I'm going to be like, but you know that the Stamp Act was repealed before <laughs> this, you know what I mean? And it's just like, forget it, dude, forget it. <laughs> just play what's happening in the thing because it'll drive yourself crazy, especially with that thing because there was so much 
information being conveyed in that thing. He's also been played in other things before, like 1776. Yes. But I don't suppose you went back and, and looked no, at that. No, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't go look at that. He's an interesting guy. I mean, when I got this, talk about an unlikable character. When I got the script, it was like a phone book, like two phone books. And phone books don't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> For the young people out there, a phone, a phone book, book. <laughs> <laughs> something you would put under your kitchen table <laughs> to keep it from That's wobbling. Right. Yeah. And I, and I read it, and I remember saying, okay, this, I, mean, I was amazed they were asking me to do it. And I said, you know, this is going to be a nine-hour movie about a really unbearable guy. And I was like, I'm going to make him unbearable. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay. I was like, I'm going to really make him unbearable. <laughs> I was like, because that'll be more interesting to me, because we think of these guys as, you know. Yeah. And, and I was like, no, it's really fascinating to play him as a real, he was, people thought he was crazy, mm -hmm. too. Legit crazy. A lot of those founding fathers were. Very eccentric. <laughs> they, no, they were. They, they were probably very had syphilis. What's, so, well, yeah. syphilis, yeah. sure, that happens. <laughs> and But they were eccentric, yeah. and they were, they were, yeah, they were intense guys guys and so i was like this will be interesting i didn't want it to play it like he was the marble bust postage stamp yeah. image we have of these guys well now he's so iconic he doesn't even have to appear in hamilton they just have to talk about him and everybody knows i was very disappointed he was you know i kind of was too i was disappointed i thought mm -hmm. you could do a cameo <laughs> that would have been great but i went and saw it and i was like where the fuck is john adams <laughs> <laughs> oh, please tell me you asked Lynn Manuel Miranda. I did go backstage yes. with my son. I took my son to see it, and he did. There was some rap. There was some song about John Adams yes, that got cut, and he did that for me. Wow! I was like, "Thank you, sir. Thank you." That's amazing. Sure, they couldn't find anyone to play him. Clearly, so yeah, that's what it was. I wasn't available. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the same year as John Adams, you took on what might have been your most challenging role to date as Paul Giamatti in Cold Souls. Um, now we see actors sort of playing heightened versions of themselves pretty regularly, but this was fairly new at the time. Um, and I'm, I'm giving you credit by saying heightened version. Maybe he wasn't. No, I would like to think okay. it was a heightened okay. version. It's an odd little movie. I don't know how many people have really even seen that movie. Oh, more people than I thought have seen it. Um, it was a funny little movie. Yeah, no, I mean... Yeah, it was, it was, I, I, the, the idea, I got the idea. It was like playing this very neurotic New York sort of stage mm -hmm. actor guy was the idea. And he had my name. She did, the director, Sophie Bart, did want to add more that was more kind of biographically oh, yeah? true to me. And I was like, mm, that's good. We don't need to like <laughs> put actual <laughs> biographical facts. Because I didn't, I didn't want it to literally be me. But, it, but a heightened version, you know, the idea mm -hmm. was this kind of Woody Allen character, neurotic actor guy, you know. And he has his soul removed so he can play Uncle Vanya. That's right. His soul, he can't take it. He, he's, he's, got this, he's got this overburdened soul. He's such a sort of soulful guy. He's like, I can't take it anymore. So he reads about a service in, on Roosevelt Island, which is funny if you know what <laughs> Roosevelt Island is like in, in New York City, uh, that they'll extract your soul. And your soul comes out as a different physical object everybody has a different physical object so some people it's like it looks like a tire like a car tire your soul and then my soul looks like a, my soul looks like a chickpea yeah you know? it's like a single sad garbanzo <laughs> bean like like a canned chickpea too like this yeah and i'm like oh that's it yeah <laughs> it was an, it's an odd little movie. It was yeah. fun. It was great yeah. to make, yeah. Well, m m it begs the question, though. Um, have you ever played Uncle Vanya? Do you want to... No, I never have. I play it in that movie. There's That's stuff true, where I do. play it in that movie. People have asked me to do it a lot. And, I mean, it's an amazing play. I've done a lot of other Chekhov plays. Um, it's funny. I don't... I don't have the greatest desire to play Uncle Vanya. I feel like in some ways a lot of what I've done adds up to Uncle Vanya. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm a little bit like, it feels a little bit like, yeah, of course that guy's going to play Uncle Vanya. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it does, I, I get a little bored at the idea yeah. of me playing Uncle Vanya. I don't know. It just doesn't, somebody else will be more interesting than I will. Too on the nose, you think? Or, or something. I just, yeah. I've played a lot of guys like that. And I just feel like, yeah, you know, somebody else will do more, something more interesting. Well, something I did get to see you in was in, in 2013, you did Hamlet. Um, which was phenomenal. Oh, thanks. Was that was that the, your last time on stage? Yes. Wow. Yeah, I hadn't been on stage in a while either. Wow. Yeah. What? No, I know I hadn't been on stage. I was like, I'll do Hamlet. Why not? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> that guy who directed it, who runs the drama school at Yale and runs the Yale Rep Theater, 
had offered it to me a bunch of times over the years, and I'd always gone, I can't play Hamlet. Nobody's going to buy me as Hamlet. That's a weird. He was like, no, I think it's a great part for you. And I was finally 46 years old, and he offered it to me. I was like, what am I, crazy? I should have done it. Now I'm too old, but I'll do it. You know what I mean? I wish I'd done it when I was younger. Mm. What so it's fine. That part you can play it kind of at any time. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. yeah. That's what. I was, and what do you when you go into something like that that's been played, you know, iconically by so many people? What do you hope to bring to it? Well, it's it's funny because it's true. But and I've done other Shakespeare, and I uh, trained in Shakespeare, and I'm pretty familiar with a lot of it. That was the weirdly that was probably the play I knew actually the least, which really? is strange. I mean, as much as famous as it is. I'd, I'd read it once a long time ago, and I had never seen it done. I'd never seen any of the movies. I'd never seen it performed. So in a way, I was lucky. I didn't have a lot of baggage about it. And I remember reading it and going, he's funny, actually. Yeah. He's actually very funny in this very dark way. And that was the thing that I thought. I remember saying to the director, he's funny. And he was like, yeah, he's funny sometimes. I was like, no, I think he's funny a lot. And he was like, okay, go with that. Because I tried to lean into the humor. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I don't know how you do this if you don't lean into the weird humor of it. So Definitely. I played a funny Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a kind of black humored mm -hmm. Hamlet, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. anyway. Um, what has been your most challenging role, whether, you know, it was a difficult role or sometimes just the situation is difficult or sometimes it's not a good script, which makes it the most challenging of all, I would think? I, I think that John Adams was actually the most challenging thing because of the, simply the sheer amount of what I had to do. And it was just intimidating. It was really, really intimidating. And most of the time I was scared just because I wasn't, just how much I had to get through every day was I going to be able to get through it. And I still remember the first day they put all the age makeup on me. Mm. And I just was like, oh my God, you know, am I going to be able to pull this off with all the shit I have to say today too? And then I, they're going to take it off of me and I have to go back to being 35. And then I have to be 57. And then I have, it was just like, I never knew where I, it was just, it was incredibly difficult, that job. And the script kind of went out the window. Oh, really? Pretty early on. After about the second episode, the script kind of vanished. So I was wow. getting handed the lines a lot of the time. Oh. So I just was, yeah. That was so an I, evil laugh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. And it was, it was, uh, that was hard. You know, we would have no time to do stuff. I developed like a photographic memory. It was really, really weird. So I had to. If I didn't, we would have just screwed. You know, unfortunately, that language is like Shakespeare. It sticks in your mm -hmm. head pretty easily. So that was very intimidating, that job. You actually just ended a, a long run on the show Billions. Um, yes. Oh, thanks. Thank you. What was it like to, you know, play a character for so many episodes over so many seasons? I'd never done anything yeah. like that, and it's, it was wild, you know? I mean, seven years of that same guy. It was intense. Um, you know, that show is well-written, and so the language is always interesting. It was always interesting, because I gather, you know, it wasn't having to do Law & Order over and over again <laughs> and play the same lawyer scene over and over and over again there was a lot of variety in it it was a real character you know so it was it was it was great but it was um it was a lot and i don't know i mean god bless it if i got the chance to do one again i, I would do it but i gotta know i don't know if i uh, seven years i'm like that's a lot you know yeah. it was a wonderful thing but it was it was a lot were you hesitant to commit to it for that reason? No, I was. I was stupid, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll do that, sure." You know, and people said, "You sure?" People I knew had done it. They were like, "Are you sure?" I was like, "Yeah, sure, I'm sure." You know, and they were like, "It could go on for a long time." I was like, Poof, "It's not going to go on for a long time." <laughs> and I don't think those guys thought it was going to go on for a long time. I think everybody was surprised how long it went on. But you're already back on TV. You're doing Thirty Coins. Oh yeah, yeah. I love that, that show Does so much. Does anybody watch? Oh, you, you. Yeah, I okay. I love. That. I've recommended that show to so oh, many friends. Oh, good. My good, good, good. Friends good, good. did the English dub for it. That's ah, how I okay. got turned on okay, to it. Cool. Yeah. Does but you should not watch, watch the English show? dub. Does anybody know what that show is? Yes. Coins? It's really great. It's on HBO or whatever it's called. Max, HBO Max. What that? Why did they do that? <sighs> I've heard theories, but I don't want to put them out there. Really? Mm. That's so confusing, man. Yeah. And it's like, so I don't know what to call it. It's on that. And it's great. It's a Spanish so language bad. horror show. 
and it's really crazy. And it's by this fantastic Spanish director named Alex de la Iglesia, who's a great director, and he does horror stuff, but it's bananas. Crazy. And, and I, they, they did the first season, I was not in it, and they came to me, because he was a big Billions fan, he said, will you do the second season? And I was like, sure, and I read it. And it's so crazy what I had to do, and I was like, absolutely. This you weren't already a fan of the show? No, I hadn't seen it. Wow. No, okay. just, it came to me, and then I watched it, and I read it, and I thought, this is fantastic, and I like horror a yes, lot. Yes, yes, so, that's what I've heard. So I was like, this will be great to do, yeah. Have you done a straight up horror movie, aside from that first one, maybe? Um, I, I produced a horror movie. I helped produce a horror movie called John Dies at the End. Oh, right. Of yeah, course. Which is a really of fun. Course. Yeah, I helped because I love that director's movies. Uh, Bubba Hotep was a movie Phantasm. that I love. Yeah, yeah, Phantasm, all those things. Don Coscarelli. And we tried to get a Bubba Hotep sequel made, and we couldn't. And he said, I have this other thing. This will be easier to make. And I was like, this is insane, this movie. What, how do you think this is easier to make? Somehow he did it. He pulled it off. But I helped produce that just because I really wanted, I think that guy should have made more movies. Yeah. You know, he doesn't make that many movies because he's got crazy movies he likes to make. And um, so, yeah. And then I, I had a little part in it, but, you know, it was just fun to, fun to be in it. Going back to 30 Coins, which I could just talk about for hours, um, did you go back and watch the first season yeah, then? Yeah, I watched oh, the first okay. season, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I always, you, just, you have to check this show out. There's Bananas. one episode where there's a mirror, oh, and there's a book the on mirror the table thing is amazing. that's in the mirror, but not there in real life. There's a whole the different world in the mirror it's, and stuff. It's really fucking yeah. freaky, that show. It really it's, is. It really messed with me. It is. It's yeah. scary. I don't get scared easily. It's funny, too. I mean, yeah. there's a humor in it and stuff, but I don't scare easily, and some of it really freaked me out. Yeah. And in this season, Season two, there's some really creepy, weird stuff in it. Oh, yeah. It's so good. It's really fun. Uh, <laughs> we have a question from Lane Allison. Um, Given your tremendous gifts as an actor, I have to believe you would be a dream to work with as a director. Are there any plans to direct more in the future? No, oh, I've never had any impulse to direct something. I, I mean, agree. I mean, I'm lazy, so that yes, it's a lot of work. But it's also, I just don't. I know it just. It's I can't. I don't know how people do it. It's like being an architect or something, the conception of the whole thing in your head, and then everything goes wrong, and it's not going to be the thing you conceived in your head, but it will be the thing you conceived in your head. It's just, I can't, the whole thing is just so beyond me. And I don't know that I'd be very good as a director of, uh, of actors. I don't think I'd actually be that good. Well, what do you like from a director? You've worked with so many amazing ones. Trust is nice. Yeah. Trust that you're going <laughs> to not screw it up is nice. Um, not, I mean... I'm not terribly articulate about it. I get worried about talking too much about it. So somebody who can talk to me the right amount without talking about it too much is nice. You know, it's nice to have somebody who likes your work, but is critically likes your work. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Who will like address you, you know, who will direct you, but not too much. And you know, so it's, it's tricky, but trust is a really important thing and you don't get it very often. Really? Not real trust. You know what I mean? It's funny how rare it actually is. Hmm. Yeah. You would think if they're casting you, they trust you. No, you'd be surprised. And, <laughs> and, you know, but it's tricky. I get it because, and this is why auditioning, I sometimes miss it because you don't have that moment to, to tack the part and show them what you're going to do yeah. or sort of get to know it or something. They'll offer you a thing and you show up and there's uh, frequently there's a kind of, period of time where they're just like I hope he doesn't do something too weird I hope he doesn't do something <laughs> crazy and I and you kind of are like I won't do anything to nobody's really saying this yeah. but you're like you know I'm not going to do anything too crazy don't worry about it you know I do something crazy and it upsets them <laughs> you know and it's like it's just weird it just it's it's it, it adds a layer of trickiness to mm. it that you know you have to get you have to build the trust and sometimes you don't fully get it and stuff you know do you remember the last time you did audition for something um, well, I actually offered to audition for something about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago or something like that. Because again, I was like, I'd read this script and I don't know why. I, it, was a, it was a historical figure and I think it was maybe going to come to me or something. I don't remember. It, it, they were sort of interested in me, but interested in somebody else. And I said, well, I'll audition for it. And my agents were like, oh, no, that looks terrible if you audition. <laughs> and I was like, this is so stupid. It doesn't look terrible. You know, it's like some, like I look weak or something. Yeah, it's yeah. really dumb. And I was like, no, I, he did, this guy doesn't know if I can do this because I had to appear to be this fairly well-known person. And uh, so I did that. And I, 
I didn't get the part, which, you know, totally cool. But I wanted to. Yeah. I wanted to for exactly yeah. the reason I just said, to be like, show the guy whether I can do it or not. And he said, you can't do it. So I will. <laughs> you are, you yeah, are not you invited know. to do my movie. And I was like, that's cool. Great. You know what I mean? It was Better a very, to find out before you totally, show up Totally. Exactly. Yeah. Better than showing up and have the guy be like, oh, shit, did I do the wrong thing and all that stuff, you know? Have you ever been fired from a role? I've heard every actor has. I, I've, there was a, I went in on something, and um, yes, I went in to do the table read, and afterwards, uh, things they went, they decided they were going to go a different way. way. I'd been hired, and yeah, then I, then that, that went away. Yep. And there's other times I can't even. Th I've, yeah, I've had other things happen, but that was the clearest sort of like, thank you for, thank you, thank you for showing up. And <laughs> thanks a lot, and I, and I was invited to go home. So. When you were talking about playing this other role was a famous historical figure, I was really hoping you were talking about when you played God on Amy Schumer. Um, but you got that part, so it couldn't be that one. <laughs> no, no, no. That was great. I loved that. <laughs> I ran into her in the street. I didn't know her or anything. Really? And she said, I have this thing I wrote I really want you to do. And then she sent me that. And I was like, this is funny. And I think that thing is really funny. Oh, it's hilarious. Thing. Yeah, it's really yeah. funny. Yeah. And also, how nice to be offered the role of God. God, I know. Yeah. I was like, how interesting. How interesting. Who's not odiferous. He's not odiferous. No, not at all. He's very clean. He seems very cleanly. Yeah, yeah that very guy. white. Yes. He's white. Yeah, he's all he's in white. <laughs> we had a big debate about whether I should wear a robe and sandals or that ridiculous <laughs> white that I'm wearing. And she was like, the white is funnier than the robe and sandals. It kind so of it is. is. It is. It's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question from Mark Harbecki, I think. Sorry if I butchered that. Um, Paul, one word vertical. Is it happening anytime soon, especially given the larger role Mary Louise Burke has in book two. This is Greek to me. Maybe you can explain I it. I think that's the um, sideways. It, the guy wrote a second oh, yes, sideways book. Is course, that right? Of course. Of course. Yes. Yeah, right? Yeah. So that's like the second sideways book. You know, they talked about it, I think. I got to be honest. I was not interested in doing it. I was kind of like, uh, I was like, that movie needs to just be left where it is. Mm. You shouldn't know what happens to those people. Uh, unless you want to make a movie when we're all really old. That would be kind of interesting. We're all like 80 or something. If we're all still alive, that could be kind of interesting. But no, I just feel like that movie needs to stay where it is and you don't know. It's just left open-ended. Yeah. Well, I know. I have in my own mind yeah, exactly great. what happened. But that's so. exactly what it yes. should be. Yeah, that's exactly what it should be. Um, I'm curious because you have done so many different roles and genres. What is it people want to talk to you about most when they see you? Is there a specific performance or movie? No, it sort of varies. It depends. I mean, it's like the TV show is a thing. Billions is a thing a lot of people recognize me for. I think consistently for a while, the thing that everybody, because it's been generations of people seeing it, is um, the kids' movie I did, Big Fat Liar. Oh my gosh, of course. Yeah. Yes. That's probably the thing people recognize. I love it. that. I, and, and all kinds of people all over the fucking world. And it's like people are like, the blue man, like that. <laughs> And I'm always like, I love that movie, so it's great. Oh, you know, I amazing. love doing that movie. But that's probably the thing I get more recognized for the most. Really? Because generations of people have seen yeah. it now. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, and people still see it. They show it to their kids and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah I was watching um, Election on HBO the other day because they're showing it like five times a week. Um, and uh, I forgot where I was going with this. Um, oh, Big Mama's House came on. Oh, yeah. And you're so committed in that. I love that. <laughs> I loved doing that. That was yes. really fun, that movie. That movie that was is a blast. so much better than it has any right to be. Uh, yes, it's really that's for sure. Funny. Yes. I was yeah. in a couple of movies like that that's like, this is right. way better than it has any right to be. Big Fat Liar and, and Private Parts, but Big Mama's House, definitely, yeah. yeah. That was a fun movie to make. I haven't seen that movie in ages. Does it ever surprise you when you see a movie and it turns out better than you expected? Uh, yeah, sure, definitely. A lot of times I'm like, boy, that was better than I thought it was going to be. And, <laughs> and almost invariably I see myself and go, boy, I'm better than I thought I was going to be. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. So at this point in your career, are you still learning new things about acting? Oh, for sure. I don't know anything about acting. So I'm all about learning what the hell is going on. I've, I've, I mean, I've unlearned a lot of things. So I don't know anything I realize mm -hmm. about acting anymore. You know what I mean? I don't know anything. And it's like, so I'm all for seeing what the hell I can learn. Because I figured, I, I realize now I don't know anything. You know, I don't know anything about anything. Yeah. And it's a good place to be, you know? <laughs> and it's like, but definitely acting. I'm like, man, this is a mystery to me. And so I just hopefully will get better at it, you know? 
Is there any particular role or even genre that you'd like to play? I mean, yeah, I, I would love to do more horror stuff. Yeah. I can, I, I, or science fiction stuff. I'd love to do a Western. I'd like to do a private eye thing. I don't know what I'd play in a Western, but, but I'd love to do it. Alexander talks about doing a Western. Really? Yeah. That'd be amazing. That'd be great. And yeah. I'm like, I don't know what I would play. I play like the barkeep or something, you know, <laughs> like the guy cleaning the glasses and stuff. <laughs> oh, that was good that space guy, work. Yeah, 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 you know that guy. That'll be me. If you're gonna make a movie about that guy, that'd be funny. Make a whole movie about the barkeep. <laughs> What does the barkeep do when he goes home? It's a good idea, actually. He did actually say that this is a long time ago, so I don't know if this is what he wants to do. But he did say he wanted to make a movie about an immigrant in the West who has a restaurant, who opens a oh. restaurant. But I don't know if that's what he'll ever do. But I remember him saying that. Um, an Italian restaurant? I don't. Probably Greek. If oh, if yeah, I know anything, because he's yes. Greek. But um, I would like the one thing I know is I would love to play a character who does not talk as much. I would like to play the guy who doesn't talk, you know, because I have to. Oh, I play guys who talk a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, and it's like I like to play the guy who doesn't talk so much. Really? Yeah, because it's just you know it's a visual medium, you know, and it's nice to do it all with your face. Like I'd love to play yeah. a dude who just doesn't, not articulate, doesn't talk very much. I don't know what that part would be, but it'd be fun for me to not have to rely on words as much. And to just rely on my body and my face and stuff. I'd, I'd like that. You know what I've always thought, and please take this as a compliment because it's going to sound weird. Um, <laughs> always a good way to preface something. Yeah. That they should do a remake of M and you should play the Peter Lorre role. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you can finally play the child molester. I can finally play the child molester. <laughs> oh, wow. That would, be, that would be amazing. I mean, he doesn't talk a whole lot in that until he sort of gets to that trial, that sort of kangaroo right. court where he freaks out. He's one of my favorite actors. He's amazing. He's a genius. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, that would be great. Uh, didn't I think they maybe sort of have done that. They did a stage version in uh, Boston at least, I know. Yeah. That I, I feel that like I they caught, have yeah. done a sort of Yeah, it wasn't great. It. <laughs> yeah. it's, a t it's an amazing movie. It's yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, they tried to do like a funny version of it. Oh, yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, what, a, what a riot that movie is. That's interesting. <laughs> Interestingly, the, the detective in that, I did this movie, The Illusionist. Oh, I love that and movie. And I love that movie, too. That's kind of one of my favorites. And the detective in that, I sort of, a little bit, took a little bit of that guy. Yeah. It's a great character in that movie and it was a little bit of that guy I would took for the for the character so cool yeah. I just remember that was the year that the prestige also came out so there yeah. were two movies yeah about weird magicians. yeah dueling yeah. magician movies yeah oh weird. but that movie's so fantastic it's a lovely movie yeah <laughs>